Sir Walter Raleigh, the nymph's reply to the shepherd. Now, Marlowe's writing of his pastoral sparked a lot of parodies, a lot of responses, because you might want to think, well, what did the, what did the love say? Did she say yes or did she say no? Um, so Walter Raleigh comes up with, huh, why don't I give him a response? So he comes up with the nymph's reply, so in essence the love's reply, to the shepherd. And so we see her counter um, and tell him what she thinks and what she wants. Um, this is very similar to a parody like you would, uh, you've heard of Weird Al Yankovic. He doesn't change the music, he just changes the words. All right? He might change the rhythm and the, and the beats and make it more polka-ish. Um, but those are always parodies. And they're always loosely based on some original where if you listen, you know exactly what song he's, he's riffing on. Here, you know exactly what poem uh, Rally is riffing on. Um, on 259, uh, some information about him. This gentleman, you might remember him as uh, you know, an explorer. Sir Walter Rally was one of the first explorers to come over to America. He set up the tobacco fields and the tobacco trades in North Carolina. Why do you think they named it Raleigh, North Carolina? North Carolina Tar Heel fans? It's based on this guy. Okay, Raleigh. Um, he was the epitome of a Renaissance man, looking at all those things that he did. Uh, he was rumored to be one of the lovers of Elizabeth. Remember, she did not get married. Okay, she did not have kids, but that doesn't mean she didn't um, have men, have boyfriends. And he was definitely um, one of them. Um, Interesting thing about his life, he went from a war hero, favorite of the queen, and most loved man in England, to a heretic accused of high treason and a prisoner of the court for more than a decade. Um, so after she died, her cousin James I from Scotland came down, and there was some uh, friction uh, between Raleigh and James I, and, and you can see more about that uh, in reading about his imprisonment and so on. Um, but, you know, being an explorer, being a courtly love of Elizabeth, okay, being a poet. That's that Renaissance man, good at a lot of different things. Um, page 280 and 281, the building background and the actual uh, nymph's reply. Um, notice where it says, uh, right, the second paragraph there, that Raleigh's nymph rejects each worldly pleasure the shepherd offers. The themes of the poem echo the themes that appeared in many of his works. The swiftness of time's passage, the vanity of youth, the corruption of society through greed and power, the inevitability of death, and the lies of lovers. We're going to see the nymphs reply here, and it wasn't as positive in love. She wasn't moved by all of those, those nature things. Imagine some city girl. Would she be moved by that? Find some New Yorker, and she comes out to Huntertown, and they're trying to sell her on the, the, the gloriousness of Hunter. And I'm not slamming Huntertown, just the, the polar opposites. Do you see what I'm saying? And so this is somewhat comical and was very popular in its day just because it was counterpoint to what Marlowe's was. Listen to the selection. The Nymph's Reply to the Shepherd by Sir Walter Raleigh. If all the world and love were young, and truth in every shepherd's tongue, these pretty pleasures might me move to live with thee and be thy love. Time drives the flocks from field to fold, when rivers rage and rocks grow cold, and Philomel becometh dumb, the rest complains of cares to come. The flowers do fade, and wanton fields To wayward winter reckoning yields. A honey tongue, a heart of gall, Is fancy's spring, but sorrow's fall. Thy gowns, thy shoes, thy beds of roses, Thy cap, thy kirtle, and thy posies, Soon break, soon wither, soon forgotten, In folly ripe, in reason rotten. Thy belt of straw and ivy buds, thy coral clasps and amber studs, all these in me no means can move to come to thee and be thy love. But could youth last and love still breed, had joys no date nor age no need, then these delights my mind might move to live with thee and be thy love.
So in essence, the title, The Nymphs Reply to the Shepherd, you could think of the city girls. You know, she even says there at the end, if all of these nature things would move me, then yeah, I would come with you and be thy love. But it doesn't excite me. That, remember that painting, that, that picture setting that we picked, you know, with the birds singing that we set, you know, on the rock and everything? Look at what she says about that. You know, time, line five, time drives the flocks from field to fold when rivers rage and rocks grow cold. And Philomel becometh dumb, the rest complains of cares to come. So, in essence, in a beautiful summer day, wouldn't you like to sit there on that stone, a nice warm stone in the sun, and the beautiful breeze coming by? Would you want to sit there in January? No. That view of the field and the flock, that flock's gone. That rock's cold. That river bubbles and rages, and it's not that little bubbling brook anymore. And those birds that are singing, are birds singing now in January? No, they're gone. And so that beautiful setting, yeah, that might be nice for a little while or every once in a while or seasonal, but what you are offering me isn't what I want all the time because you can't provide that, what you're saying, all the time. The flowers, remember the bed of roses that she was going to get and the caps and all that? The flowers do fade. And wanton fields to wayward winter reckoning yields. A honey tongue, a heart of gall, is fancy spring, but sorrows fall. Notice all of these things. The rhythm, the words. Is Raleigh coming up with new things to describe nature? No. That's right. He's counterpointing everything that the previous poem mentioned. Everything Marlowe uses to try to woo her. Raleigh throws it back into the shepherd's face. You know, remember the gowns and thy shoes and thy bed of roses, the cap, thy kirtle, and the posies. Those will be nice, but what happens eventually? Well, they soon break or soon wither or soon forgotten in folly ripe in reason rotten. Thy belt of straw and ivory buds, thy coral clasp and amber studs, all these in me uh, where are we? All these in me, no means can move to come to me. So these things aren't interesting to me at all. No means can move me to come to thee and be thy love. None of these do. But could youth last and love still breed? Had joys no date, no age, no need? Then these delights my mind might move to live with thee and be thy love. So if youth could last forever, if we could you know, harness what we have now forever and not grow old or wander in our lovings for each other and all these things. Yeah, maybe you could get, persuade me, but it's not going to happen. Okay, I'm not, it's not. I think what's really neat is that, that parody aspect with regards to utilizing the same lines. Didn't you catch that as we were going through? Not just the same words here and there, but some of these were identical lines. And that just makes his use of his words that much more stronger and gets to the point a little bit better. Okay? Um, so these are two wonderful pastorals in that look at how they focus on the natural life, the things you can get from nature, but more importantly, the appreciation of nature, that natural, enjoyable life. Even though that's what this one's about, even though she, the city girl, doesn't necessarily enjoy that or think that it lasts forever, it's still talking about the natural life and professing it, okay?